Hello, my name is James Pikeway, and welcome to day seven of public speaking in the summer. My summer class, what you've dialed into, is really a podcast of my summer lectures on how to be a better presenter and better public speaker. And today, it's all about managing expectations, types of speeches that you can do that are informative and how you can really make them work. And as with all my lectures, we go back over the basic things that one wants to be thinking about when they're doing a great talk. You're gonna love it. This is day seven of public speaking in the summer with me, James Pikeaway. Day seven, hello everybody. Great to see you. And we are, we're, we're turn, turning ahead. This is your informative speech class and your informative speech week. Thursday, we do informative speeches. So that's kind of cool. Looking forward to hearing that and seeing where you're, you're getting to this week. So that'll be a lot of fun. Lots of things to be thinking about. Now, here's the, the, the really important stuff. As you're thinking about where we're going with the informative speech, remember everything that we're doing in every class rolls over into your next class, rolls over into your next speech. So you're constantly building on these speeches that you're doing, building on your skill set, building on all of that material. That's really important that you keep thinking like that. So unlike many of the other classes that, that you take, where you do something and then you just kind of get rid of it, it's gone. I don't need to think about that anymore. In this class, one, you need to roll over and keep applying everything that you're doing. And two, two, you need to be practicing this stuff. You need to be trying this stuff. You need to be really breaking free of your old speaking habits and start thinking about the new ones. Start thinking about vocal variety. Start thinking about how you're organizing your ideas. Start thinking about how you're transitioning from one idea into the next one. Is it flowing? Does it make sense for your audience? And have I brought it all together in the end? Have I given people sort of a nice little reminder? What did I talk about? Why did it matter depending on the context of your speech, etc.? Have I done all that? You need to be doing that every time and working on that finesse. So here's the big challenge that you all face is, of course, of course, we've talked about outlining. And I think it's important, important, important that you you outline your speech. You start putting together the, the packets, the bits. I, like many, many, many people, strongly recommend that you use post-it notes. So you're not sitting on your computer. You just start post-it noting it out. Then you start writing out what you want to do. But don't get caught in the writing trap. Remember, 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 reminder again, when you're writing out your speech... You need to write it like you would say it, not write it like you would write a term paper. We're all great at doing term papers, and you've been doing a lot of that throughout your entire university career and your high school career. You've been writing term papers. And then you turn around and you do a presentation, and we all have been to those presentations. And what do people do? They get to the presentation, and they read it. Oh, that's horrible. That's not what you want to do. That's a C. Ladies, that, you might as well just give everyone the text that, you, that you're going to read and let them read it and you just stand there and smile at them. Like this. Here, this is the one I would use. Because they can read. Your job is to present the core ideas and the relevance and why it's important and make it interesting and bring it to life, not just to read what you've done. So that's, that's the diff real big difference between speaking, presenting, and writing a term paper. Now, here's the challenge that you are facing, and it's, it's, it, it's small but huge. Do you like that one? It's small but huge. So the, the huge challenge is... You're not used to talking and presenting your ideas and using those words and connecting it together and taking the, just the small bits and building that out as your presentation. We're not used to doing that. That's a change. It's a great change. It is the change you want to have, but you're breaking old habits. Now, in a regular semester, we would be on week seven of the semester. 
And seven weeks to break the old habits is pretty good. You've had seven days of class, which means essentially, that, you know, in three weeks, you've really got to be putting in that effort. You've really got to be saying to yourself, I'm going to do it different. I'm going to do it different. It's going to feel different. It's going to feel awkward sometimes. That's good. It's kind of like... It, there's there's two things going on here, ladies. One, you you all need to have that that conversational flow, yet yeah, presentation flow in your voice, and and the, the that emotion is good. That's vocal variety. The, exactly what you're talking about is with with a pair of shoes. I'm making a I'm making a comparison and analogy here, Hind, to the way, what we're doing in this class is it feels awkward when I say I want you to talk like me. It feels awkward when I say, I want you to pause. It feels awkward when I say, I want you to talk a little faster. It feels awkward when I say, I want you to sound like you're talking with your friends, not in necessarily the words, but in the style of conversation as you're presenting these ideas. That feels really awkward. It feels different. It feels like, hold on a second. Is that professional? Yes, it is. (laughs) It's absolutely professional. It's the way you're presenting the content and don't let someone tell you though that's, you know, that's not professional. How is it not professional? Are you professional? Are you presenting the content in a manner that people are going to consume it and think about it? And yes. So it's all of the things that we're doing. The point of this being, thank you very much, Hen, and sorry that you haven't received your online order yet. All of the things that I'm talking about here is, is you've got to push through it and keep on going. And this is, this is the, the, the challenge of this course is, and you're, you're succeeding, ladies. Don't get me wrong. You're succeeding. The challenge is you got to do it. And it's not, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a paper and I got a whole bunch of time in this. You're physically performing. You're physically doing the talk. You're physically doing these things. And remember, yes, you could have an introduction and yes, you could have a clue, conclusion. Unless you could have three parts and you could go out and do it. And, you know, if there's no vocal variety and if you're not pausing and if you're just kind of going on and that tone, yes, you've done all the stuff. All the stuff's a C. And that's the important thing to keep remembering. You need to push yourself. If you just do everything I ask, exactly the way I say, you know, just, uh, and you just do all the best. You say, yeah, but I do have a conclusion. Some of you do. Yes. But if it's just, a, you know, it's just, there we go. This is the piece. And, and in conclusion, this is a, that's a C. It's a C. You need the vocal variety. You need the emotion. You need the pausing. You need to think how I'm transitioning through. All these little things are what push you into the zone of an A. And that's work. And it gets, it becomes more work with each speech because the more we meet, the more we talk, the more you should be practicing and stuff each time. So you want to play with that. Route is asking, Route MZ, can you talk more about PowerPoint and what do you want in it? We're actually, that's what we're doing this week. There is no PowerPoint in your presentation your informative presentation, no PowerPoints. It's just you again. The persuasive and the final talk will be an opportunity to put visuals in. And we're talking about those. That's where we're going partially a little bit today, definitely tomorrow, or sorry, definitely on Tuesday. And then on Thursday, you're going to do your speech. We'll talk a bit about persuasive speeches and we'll be building in the, the, issues of visuals throughout the rest of the course safe to say what I don't want what I don't want does anyone know can you can in in, in one word four words the usual ZU PowerPoint I don't want the usual ZU PowerPoint and what is the usual ZU PowerPoint one slide that comes up says the outline. I'm going to do an introduction. I'm going to, and then a bunch of slides that are usually done off a template that are usually chock full of as much word as possible with some terrible pixelated images every now and then, two or three ideas per slide, and a long video. 
okay, I'm, I'm overgeneralizing and I've, I've put everyone in there. Those are not good presentations. It's not what you want to do. And so we're, you, we're, 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 we're circling back in our minds and we're saying, okay, what do we want to do? Well, what's the number one thing that we need to remember as we're doing presentations? Who watched the Gar, the Gar, <coughs> excuse me, who watched the Gar, Ren, uh, Gar Reynolds presentation? Did anyone watch Gar Reynolds? Did anyone go and take a look at Gar from last? Uh, he was, he was, he was, I put him into our stuff from week six, right? So if you go to week six, you're going to see presentation Zen and you're going to see some in- information. Did anyone give Gar a watch? I, I think Gar is excellent. I really, in, and I would highly, you know, there's a, about three or four books that I, I highly recommend. Great. Ur, Rauda, Fatma. Perfect. You want to watch all these things. They're not so long. And I, I highly recommend you take out a piece of paper and, and you start writing. And so what's, you know, he, he, he says the same thing that I say, right? At the very beginning, he goes through a number of steps on how you tell a great story and how you put together great presentations. This stuff, and this is the reality This stuff that he's talking about is what people in IBM, what people in Apple, what people around the world, what Tedsters, what TED presentations are paying to be educated in how to do presentations. That's what he's talking about. Brilliant and easy. Tailor that to your your whole story. So one of the things he says, is, and he says it right at the very start, he says, plan it out. He says, turn off your computer, and he shows some, some slides and things. Now, this is where it becomes interesting when people say, so how do you want us to do our PowerPoint presentations? What's the second point in his presentation? What's the second thing he says? Does anyone remember? Don't go back and look. Does anyone remember? Because he had a number of points, right? Planning. What's the second point that he says? Audience comes first. Audience comes Fatma, yes. Audience comes first. This is, this is super, super important. And this, I think, permeates, that's the, uh, permeates, that means kind of uh, goes through everything you're doing, is, is the core of what you're doing as a speaker. And we constantly want to remember it. You're producing content, you're producing this talk, you're producing this speech for your audience. So... In that sense, you need to be thinking, well, how are my visuals, how are my ideas? So you've got your words, you've got your introduction, you've got your core three points with stories and examples, and you've got your conclusion. As the audience coming first, remember the number one thing that I keep saying is don't expect us, the audience, to get anything that you're saying. Tell us what you want us to know. Explain how it links. Give us the ideas. Of course, we're smart. Talk to us about it, but also remind us what's going on. Connect it to us. Tell us why it's important. Give us the material that we need so that we can connect it together. But then remind us how to connect it, how you want us to connect it. Audience comes first is something you constantly need to remember. Keep writing down what is what is my topic. Keep thinking about that. But remember, it's all about the audience. It's not about you. And, and this is the, be- the, the hard part. When we think about all these presentations that we do or that we listen to, if you, if you make the audience priority one, you're planning for them and you keep asking yourself, are they going to get this? Does this make sense? Does this, whatever it is I'm doing, if I'm producing a PowerPoint, does it help the audience understand what I'm talking about. And that's where I, I love what, what Reynolds does. And let me just pass forward it to a little bit because this is a perfect example. So audience, this sort of uh, three part, this beautiful three part harmony. That's the way presentations should be today as well. And storytelling is what makes us human. That's part of our DNA. It's how we have evolved. Long before Homo sapiens could read, of course, we were telling stories. So this is a great example of him using a PowerPoint. Now, he does have key phrases that he puts up, and he does have some quotes. And and again, remember, he's a designer. But here he is. He's talking about storytelling, and he's talking about the idea that this is what we do. And think about storytelling in your own history, in your own history in the UAE, where did that storytelling take place? Because it's part of your DNA. Where did it take place? Just like he says, it's part of the human DNA. 
It's definitely part of the UAE DNA. Where does this storytelling ha- storytelling happen? 20, 40, 60 today, but years, where does the storytelling take place in your own culture? Where's the big storytelling place? There's two of them actually that I can think of right now. Where does storytelling take place? Who wants to jump in? Anybody? Where does storytelling take place? Just guess, ladies, throw it out there. Just guess. It's, it's, there's two reasons you want to do it. You want to just practice talking. You want to hear your voice and, and, and you want to guess. Two places. Who can think of what they might be? Two places that storytelling is really, really been part of UAE culture. And I can think of two of them that happen. One of them, I mean, both of them are, both of them continue to happen now. All right. Place number one. Place number one, the Magellus. That and think about the history of the UAE and think about when people were traveling through. If you were, you know, think about the 1930s. If you were going from Dubai to Abu Dhabi, you'd stop in the middle. You might stop at a small town. You'd come in. They, someone would invite you in. They might give you some dates, some tea, some water. And what did they want? They wanted to hear your stories. Storytelling was so important. The Magellus, what happens in the Magellus? The stories get told. So storytelling is really important. Now think about what he's doing here in this talk. And he's got this slide. Let me turn it on again. And children, long before they can read and write, of course, they're sharing information by telling stories and using storytelling elements, even in explanatory narratives. No matter what type of narrative it is, we can use at least many story elements that will really help with the engagement of our talks. And of course, it increases the drama. We like to add a little bit of drama into presentations whenever we can. So I and my wife and our family, we live in Nara, which is just down the street from here. So you can see he's, he's doing some other things too, right, with his presentations. He's talking about, now, now he's talking about where he lives in Nara, Japan. He's showing that picture. Again, very few words. It's not about words. It's about the image telling us things. And to me, when you look at these great presentations that are around, and I use many of the great presentations that I, I use as some of them as benchmarks come from, of course, Ted and other folks, be, it, because there's so much work goes into producing them and critiquing them and refining them. And the, the, the core element as we start seeing, as we start putting our, our stories together and as we start thinking about our speeches, this, you're the speech, okay? So this is the, the really important thing to remember as we're, we're doing these things. You're the speech. The PowerPoint is an auxiliary element to you. It just highlights what you're saying. So those, those images, those things that you put up, all they help to do is bring attention and fill in the gaps to what you're saying. What you don't want people doing is spending all their time with the image, reading it, looking at stuff, and ignoring what you're saying. And so you need to find that, that balance, that fine line. And again, it's different for everyone on how you organize those things. You don't need a ton of images. You might need one. You might need two. You might need three. There might be some key things you want to use them for. But it's not like you have to have a full deck of 54 or 56 or 100 slides and all of the words of your speech on there. I mean, that's the worst kind of PowerPoint you can do. And, and ultimately... If you're producing something where you want people to be looking at a whole bunch of detail, give them the handout. Use your slides to augment what you're saying. Give them a handout that they can go to. The, the key thing to remember, and as, as we say again, the key thing to remember as you're, as you're looking at your presentations, that, that really important stuff is that your audience is the most important part of your presentation. You're presenting to an audience. You want to engage them. You want your story to be well organized and flow and you want your images to help bring that together. Now we'll keep talking about this. Don't worry. And, and that, but what am I looking for? That kind of stuff. 
And I think it really becomes important as you start thinking about it, thinking about, okay, what kind of colors am I using? People often, what do people do? Go and, and grab a template. I, I highly discourage you from doing that. Don't grab a template. It locks you into the way your things have to look. Don't do it. Simple colors, simple fonts that are big, one idea per slide, which is also one idea that you're trying to present at a time in your points. Make sure things are easy to read if you're going to put words up there. Be careful with the images. What's in them? What do those images say? If we go back to... And my job is to take kids to school and pick them up and try to be a big part of their life as much as I can. So the experts always say you shouldn't watch TV with little kids. And we don't watch TV, but we watch a lot of DVDs. In English, it's a kind of iseki nicho. Uh, we can have entertainment, but we can also learn English at the same time. And so here's, here's a great example that, that Gar is talking to us about himself and he's talking about the 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 image to talk about what he watches on dvds with his kids so they learn english and he's showing a picture of them they're watching disney he's not talking about his life he's not talking about things but this image gives you a whole bunch of information about him and the family and where he lives and all this stuff that he doesn't have to talk about think carefully about those images are there any words on that image nothing except that he's just spoken that we watch a lot of dvds and i've watched all the disney stuff and there's this child one of his children engaging with it they've got a christmas tree and they've got some kids toys so you get a whole sense of what his life is like without having to him to say anything about it it's all a construction it's all there and he's chosen what he wants to show just like you get to choose what you want to use and you're, you just want your images to fill in the gaps for what you're saying. And you don't necessarily have to say things. They, they, they fill in with you. They don't have to be full of words, but you want to make sure they work. And so this becomes really important if you're using these PowerPoints and you, you want to make sure you're constructing them. You want to make sure that they work. Like I said, how have we learned to use these things in, in, in a large part of our lives? We've learned by, oh, well, that's how it's been done. That's how someone else did it. That's how another person did it. PowerPoint makes and, and, and Keynote makes all these templates, so they must be the right way to do it. Who said that? Where is that said? And why would I want to use a template when I can construct it exactly as I want it to be? Less is more in many cases. Remember, and this is the challenge, and you've seen it, don't let the device take over your presentation because you're awesome. You're the presentation. And so think about this. Audience is number one, and you're constructing. You're putting things together for that audience. We'll keep coming back to all these things, and, and you, you get where we're going with it. And I think that's what becomes really important as we start filling in the blanks. But it's 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 important for us to remember as you're you're working on these things that they all sort of slide in together they all sort of link together and so what we're going to do is we're going to move on to talk a bit more about informative speeches but we're going to link in using props using your your images using these things and as we keep going because again it's remembering that they are secondary you need to be able to do whatever presentation you're doing without them you don't need the props you don't need the powerpoint you don't need any of that stuff because you're the presentation and so that's super super important to remember as long as you remember that and just remember, it's all about you. It's all about you constructing this spectacular presentation that's going to bring your audience on this journey so that when they're done, they go, wow, I totally get it. That's all you want them to do. You want people to say, wow, I really enjoyed that. I'm really, in she's really interesting. She's, she's really done the job. That's all you want. You want people to be applauding. You want when people are talking. And remember, we're in kind of a weird scenario in our COVID summer class because we're not seeing each other. We're not in the same room as each other. So there's a whole element of this that's not there. And, and that's, that's unfortunate. But, you know, we'll, we'll fix that when, when we do get to see each other again. We'll, we'll have a, a quick master class, a couple lunch hours if you want to join me. And I, I promise we will do that. So we've got, we've got a couple things. A, number one, we will keep talking 
about the visual stuff. And I'm just going to wrap it into what we're doing. But it's important to remember that less is more. Don't fall into that trap that it's got to look like this. Unless, unless, and this is the qualification, ladies, unless you get a professor or an organization that says, I want the PowerPoint or I want the visuals like this. If they say that, then you follow the directions. If they don't tell you, go crazy and enjoy it. Going crazy doesn't mean just overfilling everything. It means doing it the best possible way that accent, that, that complements what you're saying. So two things. We've got, we've got two sections here. We've got uh, day seven and eight. So that's today and Tuesday already loaded in here. I've also put in today's area a little uh, link to a web page, and I've just copied in the text talking about transitions. Now, transitions are really, really important because this is something that you need to think about. So not only as you're talking, you want to think about your speed, you want to think about your emotion, you want to think about those stories, you want to think about how things are going and that it's linked. So in in some of the speeches that some of you did last time around, you had just way too much information. You were just overfilling it, trying to get everything in, where sometimes it's less information, but more of you explaining things and more of the pause and more of the, so how does that, so, so how does that work? And then going into it. All the, the challenge that you face is going from your introduction to your first point, from your first point to your first example, from your first example to your second point. Those break points. And so if, if you're to look at it sort of visually, it's as you're going, you're going you're gonna to have first point and then you're going to have the second point or your, your, your first point, your first example and your first point. So here we go. There we go. First point, first example. Second point. So now I've got three things. What what do you see in between? You see you see you see nothing. You see air. What you need is something that's going to link them, right? So hold on, there we go. So you've got this thing. So I've got first example, and I want to get to my second point. I've got this little thing on the top. That's a transition. You need something that gives us that continuity. Something that pulls us through something that takes us there and so those things are called transitions how do you transition into your next point sometimes it's a big pause sometimes it's you might be saying you know as we've got here transition transitions to elaborate 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 on an idea so you might say well in other words what are we talking about and that leads you into the next thing Not only do we know that you have to be thinking about how you recycle, we also need to be thinking about how we reuse. So now that takes you into second point. Or you might say, you might say, you know, solar power is is really important. Conversely, nuclear power is also very important in this country. So now that's taking you, transitioning you into talk about nuclear power, right? So you've got to be thinking, how am I making that move? It's part of it is pause. Part of it is keywords that then link us into where we're going. And so, if, you know, again, if what if you were doing points, as it says, transition points, these, and these are not all of them. And these are not the ones necessarily to use, but think about elaborations on it. The first step in baking a cake is turn on the oven. The second step is we now have to get all the mix out. So what does that involve? If we get, we're getting all the mix out, well, we got to get the flour. We got to get the baking powder. We got to get the baking soda we got a little bit of salt got to put some sugar we need to put some vegetable oil what's the third part third part after we've turned on the oven after we've done all the mixing is the pan and don't be discouraged by the pan that's the third part the pan is the third part got to make sure it's greased Uh, that's a whole lesson in itself fourth part so we've already we've already Mix, we've already gotten out all the ingredients. We've already mixed it together. We've already greased the pan. Fourth part is the oven. What do we got to do with the oven? 
I got to turn on the heat. Got to make sure we got the humidity. We got to put that thing in there. So we got four. So, so what have I done there is I, you, you're using the fourth thing. So you're transitioning in the fourth stage of this is, and what have I done in my four stages as I'm talking about them? I keep reminding people, well, what was the first part? What was the second part? What was the third part? It was now we're in the fourth part, but what were the other three parts? Keep reminding people what they are so they don't forget. And you might be saying, yeah, but why, why am I repeating myself? Repetition is good. It builds it in. And people are going, oh, yeah, that's right. Got this. And they're wondering, where is it going? You're building some excitement. Transitions are important. And there's lots of different things and different ways you want to think about it. But you've got to be thinking about it, ladies. You don't just want to jump to the next part. You want people to know you're moving there. And you want to do it with some elegance. You want to do it with some elegance. And that means you want it to be clever. You want it to be fun. You want it to, to be part of that, that, that show that's bringing them along. And, and I think that, that's really important as you start thinking about this product because you're not just doing, you know, here it is out of the box. Yeah, I got a, and I've got an introduction. I've got a conclusion and I've got my points. Yeah, you do. But they're just point one. Point two, point three, in conclusion, here's my outline. He's like, yeah, that's, that's good. It's good. It's a C. Good is a C. No one wants to be a C. You don't, no one wants, you know, it's like, look, you want to be awesome. There's a lot of people who are good speakers, but they're not exceptional speakers. You want to be exceptional. The exceptional speaker is the person who's taking the time to think about what they're doing. The exceptional speaker is thinking about their audience The exceptional speaker is thinking about how does the story come together? The exceptional speaker is thinking, how do I make sure this this connects with my audience? And part of that is as you're telling that story, pulling them through. And so transitions become very important. So as you're thinking about them, and, and they can be very simple. They can be very simple. So for instance, you might be talking, you're doing an informative speech. So you might be informing people about Jogging. I, mean, I jog every morning with my dog. So maybe I'm going to be talking to people about jogging and I'm going to be talking to them about the, the, maybe I'm going to talk about the whole process of getting ready and what you do and making sure that you have the right shoes, making sure you have the right shorts, making sure that you have a, a nice hat to collect sweat, making sure that you have a face mask. And then I might pause and say, but there's something else that's really important that that pause so you didn't so I get, get right shoes, right hat, right fa- right face mask, right uh, face mask. Did I say? Yeah, I said face mask. Right hat, right shoes, right shorts, right shirt. All of these things, and then I pause. And there's something else that's really important that's often underestimated. I'm, I'm, and I'm doing my hands really important and often underestimated. My hands are going with each word, and I'm slowing down. That is my transition into stretching. So I've talked about all these little things and then they say there's one thing that is often totally underestimated, stretching. That often totally underestimated is the transition to my next point because now I'm going to talk stretching. So you see, I've made this transition. I've slowed down. So I've got my first area. Now I'm connecting. So I've got my stuff and now I'm connecting to the physiology of, of the activity. And so I'm transitioning through. So it's really simple, but my audience now knows that I'm moving from one area to the other. They know that in my talk, it's important because I've slowed down and I've emphasized the points. And then I, I pick it up again. And I, I start talking at a more regular pace, which ladies, your regular pace is about three words a second with a little bit of expression on your faces because that expression is heard. Now, here's your other huge challenge, and I'll say it again. We're writing our speeches out, right? And I encourage people to write speeches, but I encourage you to know the speech, not to read the speech. Easier said than done in this kind of a situation because we're not seeing each other. Don't record your speeches either, right? Don't play me a recording because that, that, don't, don't do them. Just, don't, just do it normally. But if you're going to read the speech, and some of you did that last time, guard against doing that, because if you read the speech, it sounds red. You don't want it to sound red. You want it to sound like you're saying it, which, which means you just need to really practice it more to the point that you're not reading it word for word, 
and just reading it. You're putting in that emotion and, and putting in the practice. It's like a script. You're working on that script. And, and that's, you're, you want to know what you're saying. You want to put that emotion in there. And that's really important. So you want to be thinking about that as well. So transitions, take a look at these. And as you're thinking about it, and as you're thinking about how your speech is coming together, think, do I have great transitions? Are people going to know what's going on? If you're, as soon as you say they'll get it, think again about it. Is it really going to be clear? Is it going to draw them through? Am I giving them that clue that we're going to the next thing? My experience is usually we try to be too clever. Don't be too clever. Just tell them where it's taking them in a nice way, but tell them where it's taking them. Have any questions at this point? Do we have any questions at all at this point? Any questions? Transitions are important. So really it's, it's thinking about how you're putting this whole thing together. That's what you're, you're concentrating on at this point. How am I writing out this and how is this story coming together? And then it's a matter of practicing it so that you get the vocal variety. If you, if you just read your speech, you never get vocal variety. You never get the fun. You never, you never start talking fast because you're excited. And then <gasps> something really bad happened. I lost my spot. There I was in front of the audience. They're looking at me. I'm looking at them. And they're waiting for the next word to come out of my mouth. It was nowhere to be found. You see, you, you want to play with that, that vocal variety where you're going really bad. It's, remember, remember right back to the first class, what did I say? YouTube. Mm. Okay. The first, the slides that I've put together today, have got some great stuff in them, by the way. Things that you want to keep in mind. We're talking about informative speeches. All the, we've got our reading again that I want you to take a look at. And uh, this is the informative speech reading. It's a really good reading. There's lots of material in there. So what, what's the deal? Do you have to, re- so the big question is, sir, do I have to read every single word in the reading? No and yes. Yes and No. So I've put some markers in our text. You might say to yourself, ah, okay, I I get that. I get where we're going. If you get where things are and you understand it, then do you need to go and and read every other word in in the notes? Probably not. But if you're not quite sure of something and you want to see more examples, go back to the text and read through. The texts in the readings that I put up are are really well organized. So if you get it, skip skip through pieces. If you don't get it, give it a, give it a review, give it a look. And of course, always bring those questions to us in class if you have them, because they're very useful. So we're talking today and where we're going this week is, is your informative speech. Here's an important thing to remember. And and let's throw it out to the class. Let me just change my view here. Informative speeches what is the goal? What is the primary function, the primary goal of informative speech? What do we want it to do? Who wants to jump in? Who wants to jump in? What's the goal of the informative speech? What is it trying to make you to do? Make you, what are you trying to say? What's the, what's the purpose of it? Remember, you always want to have a purpose to your speech. What's the purpose of an informative speech? Who wants to jump in? Uh, giving you information. Yeah, who, who, who's talking? I don't see who's talking here. Hold on, let's talk. uh, Taya. Taya, yeah, exactly. You, Taya, you sound, you sound awesome today. Very nice. Um, did you hear that? I just did an um. Remember, just slow down a little bit, ladies. But that's good. You're 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 giving information, and what do you want people to do with the information? What's in your mind? What do you want them to do with the information? Taya, is this is a trick question? What do you want them to do with the information? To a surprise. Yeah, maybe. Think yeah, of- to uh, let them know more information they didn't know before. Yeah. Do you have any expectation of them with the information? Uh, maybe no. Now, and, th- and this is the thing to remember. Uh, and you're right. And, and Ty, when you're talking, you practice slowing down just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. You're, it's good. You sound excellent. Just slow down. And so why I'm saying this is every time when you're practicing and we're talking in class, just practice what you want to do when you're speaking. So slow down just a little bit more, but that's good. This is the really big challenge with the informative. So informative speeches and persuasive speeches share a lot in common. They do many, 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 many things the same, except informative speeches give information and you do not expect people to do anything with it. If they do, nice. If they don't, 
that's okay as well because that's not your goal. Your goal is to give them information. It's to build their knowledge. It's to give them a view of something. But you're not trying to get them to do anything with it. If they do something, great. If they don't, that's okay as well. You're informing them. A persuasive speech, on the other hand, is an informative speech with action. You, you're, when you do a persuasive speech, it has all the bits of an informative speech because you're giving them information, except you want them to do something with it. Now, we're talking persuasive speeches, but I'm going to give you a little th- tip on a... Uh, uh, sorry, we're talking informative speeches, but I'm going to give you a little tip on a persuasive speech. And in, in my experience, most persuasive speeches, not just what that students do, but that are generally done in the world, fail. Not all of them. Some of them work. But many, many fail. And they fail because those people listening to it don't know what to do. And so keep this in mind as you're thinking about your persuasive speech. So these persuasive speeches that people do, and they're trying to persuade you to recycle. They're trying to persuade you to do less CO2 gas emissions. They're trying to persuade you to be a leader. They're trying to persuade you to stop eating so much candy. They're trying to, they're, they're, they're very, they, they end up being informative speeches where they hope you're going to do something, but you don't do anything. And why don't we do anything? Because they don't give you anything to do. And the only way a persuasive speech works is if it gets down into a micro level and says, okay, Right here, right now, this is the first step. Do it. That's, that's what makes a persuasive speech work. Otherwise, it's just an informative speech. And so keep that in mind as you start thinking about your persuasive speeches. Informative speeches are just given information. Ty, that was excellent. You, you were right on there. So there, there's often a lot of overlap. And, and, and sometimes, again, you, we might be thinking, and this is a, a, a challenge that... We face, where did our class go here? I've lost the class. <laughs> oh, terrible. <laughs> I'm laughing because I was looking at everything and I'm going, where, where did our class go? It's not here. So this is the other challenge that you face. And this is our own mental challenge, ladies, is as we're putting together our speeches and you're going to be putting together your informative speech. You're working on it now. You've probably already been working on it. And you need to wrestle. Everyone knows what wrestling is, right? You know, when you get together with your brother and sister and you're all kind of, right? you need to wrestle in your brain that what you're talking about matters is important to you. And I know, what did I say at the very beginning? Because Fatma said, it, and it comes from Gar Reynolds, the second point in his presentation, what's the most important part of a speech? The audience. And I know you're thinking in your mind, okay, there's a contradiction there, James, because you're telling us that we need to produce the speech that we love and that we're part of, but we also need to make sure that we're thinking of the audience. But you're not thinking about the audience in terms of your content of your speech. You're thinking in terms of how you're presenting your speech. So you're not, you you know, as I keep saying, you know, maybe I'm going to talk to you about juicing. This class isn't interested in juicing. I'm going to give you all the great information about juicing. And and through my presentation style, through my presentation techniques, I'm going to give you facts. I'm going to give you figures. I'm going to give you anecdotal stories. All of this stuff put together. I'm going to give you the science. By the time you're done, you're going to go, wow. That's really interesting. I learned something about juicing. And maybe you're going to be sitting at the Friday lunch with your family and there's going to be a lull and you say, hey, did you guys know? And you're going to get that from me. Or do I hope that you want to juice? Hey, it would be nice. Is that the purpose of my speech? No. Which is another little thing that you want to be thinking about as you're putting together your talk. So not only, again, this speech, there's no, no visuals. It's just you talking. But visuals are coming. But, but when you're doing a speech and remember introduction, conclusion, three points, you might not get to them. You might only get to two and example stories as you're putting it together. You also need to remember your ideas, just like when you write a term paper, really don't count. 
So yes, they're good. Yes, they're interesting. But you need to back up what you're saying with sources. And I know, I know suddenly you're going, <gasps> what does that mean? Do I have to APA style it? It's like, well, you know when you're talking. But let's say I was going to be doing a talk in COVID, COVID-19 in the UAE. And I might be saying, you know, according to the Ministry of Health today, there were 419 confirmed cases. So suddenly... I could just be saying, boy, there's a lot of COVID-19 cases in the UAE. Mm. But if I said there's a lot of COVID-19 cases in the UAE, in fact, according to the Ministry of Health, there's 419 today. Suddenly that is adding credibility to what I'm saying. And so you want sources to give credibility. If I was talking about juicing, why is juicing important? Well, according to the Ministry of Health, the number one killer of people in the UAE as backed up by the World Health Organization, 40% of people die from heart disease. And what are some of the leading causes of heart disease? Again, according to the Ministry of Health, not from me, the experts, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, which means people aren't moving very much, diabetes, three things, three things that as we know, can be solved very, very easily. So what have I done again? I've brought in more resources. Ministry of Health. And it could be a quote from someone. According to, you need to bring that kind of stuff. You need to be thinking, how do I qualify my ideas in my speech? So it's not just me saying it, but there's something that adds support to it. That's really, really important when we're talking. And it could be you've, you've read some stuff online, could be you've been reading some stuff in Albion and, and, and et cetera. And, and so you say, look, I was reading Albion, according to Dr. So-and-so, this is what we know. I was, you know, this is what, what Richard Branson said last week uh, I, 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 on, on his Twitter page. This is what the president of the United States is saying. You, you want to be able to tell people where this stuff's coming from. And of course, in the written part, give me the, the area where it is. But when you're talking about it, you don't do like an APA style. You do a, a verbal style. And that's very important as well. So back to where we're going here. A lot of stuff coming together. I rather like this talk. And this was a, a really easy one. And this is a great example of doing a, a presentation and thinking about... I'm doing this talk because I'm interested in it and I'm going to make you interested in my talk by the way I present it. So if we go to this one, Matt Coots, it's pretty, it's pretty short actually. I, I kind of like it for that. And if you don't look at any Ted Ed stuff, you should. It's pretty good. So let's just watch a little bit of it. A few years ago, I felt like I was stuck in a rut. So I decided to follow in the footsteps of the great American philosopher, Morgan Spurlock, and try something new for 30 days. So we got a couple of things going on here really quickly as we're looking at this. First, let me just back it up a second. Listen to his voice, look at his face. Philosopher, Morgan. I felt like I was stuck in a rut. So I decided to follow in the footsteps of... He's got a little expression going on. He's got facial expression. The facial expression is causing his voice to sound different. Then he goes to a... American philosopher, Morgan Spurlock. So what do we know about Morgan Spurlock? Does he talk about the movies he made? And so Super Size Me, 30 Days... You know, we we know all these things. And and Super Size Me, he went... Morgan Spurlock just ate McDonald's for like a month, right? Does he talk anything about that? No, he just shows two covers of the movies. And moves on brilliant use of visuals and they are giving you extra information because you're going oh yeah i know morgan spurlock super size me boom you know you, he doesn't have to say anymore and try something new for 30 days the idea is actually pretty simple think about something you've always wanted to add to your life and try it for the next 30 days so and then you just listen to the way he's presenting think about the idea is really simple and he pauses. Think about something you want to add to your life. So he's accentuate, add to your life, and just do it for the next 30 days. And then he goes on and he puts this 
this slide up, which is a brilliant, simple, easy slide. And watch, watch what he does. Let me back it up a little bit. But watch what he does here. Add to your life and try it for the next 30 days. It turns out 30 days is just about the right amount of time to add a new habit or subtract a habit, like watching the news from your life. So here's a really interesting one, ladies, because again, he's put up this slide. There's a load of information on it. And I know that I said, I often say, don't put a lot of words on your slides, but this particular slide, and, and there's no, it, 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 this particular slide works really well because he puts it up and he says, it's 30 days is about the time to add a habit. And he puts up four things that he did, but he doesn't say them. And then he also, or take something away and no TV, no sugar, no Twitter, no caffeine, like don't watch the news, but don't watch the news is not on that list. Well, don't watch TV. So suddenly he's talking and he's put up this slide with really an intro to what he's going to talk about without saying it. So now you're getting him talking and the slide, you're getting double the amount of time in the single small area given. Does he say anything really about this slide? No. There's a few things that I learned while doing these 30-day challenges. The first was, instead of the month... So first, a few things I learned. So he's got one. So now that's kind of his intro. He's now gotten into his first, first area. So he's gone from the intro, what he did, and how does he transition it? There's a few things I learned from doing these 30-day challenges. The first... So he's now he's into his first point. Oh, see that nice transition? So he's done this nice big intro. He's thought about it. Has he said any ums, ahs, or buts? No. Where are his notes? Is he reading this? No. He knows it. And he's used, and, and look at the audience. It's all sitting there. There's about 500 people watching him. He's relaxed. He knows what he's going to say. He knows it's going to work. He knows he's got a killer slide presentation. And he knows his topic. And he keeps going flying by forgotten the time was much more memorable the time was much more memorable see again he's vocal variety this was part of a challenge i did to take a picture every day for a month and i remember exactly where i was and what i was doing that day i also noticed that as i started to do more and harder 30-day challenges my self-confidence grew Again, vocal variety. I also noticed as I started to do more and harder challenges, my self-confidence grew. And so again, vocal variety. He's moving on to the next point. So he's talk. So what did he do? This is a, a clever way of again transitioning. He's transitioning to his next point with now he's going to talk about self-confidence. I went from desk dwelling computer nerd to the kind of guy who bikes to work for fun. Even last year, I ended up hiking up Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in Africa. I would never have been that adventurous before I started my 30-day challenges. I also figured out that if you really want something badly enough, you can do anything for 30 days. Have you ever wanted to write a novel? Every November, tens of thousands of people try to write their own 50,000-word novel from scratch in 30 days. It turns out all you have to do is write 1,667 words a day for a month. So I did. By the way, the secret is not to go to sleep until you've written your words for the day. You might be. Let's just back up for a second because this is kind of neat. When you look at this, this graph that he's put up here, easy to see. Do you need to look at all of the bits? He's got the words on the side. He's got a big word words. He's got word count, daily goal. He shows where he is. You know, gives you an idea how he went for 30 days. Is, is, is it easy to see? Is it easy to understand? Yes, yes, yes. So it, it works. Big, in your face, simple, emotions, do the, do the slides complement what he's doing? Yes. Would I, would I do some of them maybe different? Maybe. But generally speaking, they all kind of work. And they're highlighted. When he talked about Kilimanjaro, shows Kilimanjaro. When he's biking, shows biking. When he's talking about his work and he sits at his cubby, you see it. Again, all of this working with tremendous vocal variety over and over and over again. He's playing with that vocal variety. And that's what becomes really important 
as we start thinking about these talks. You don't have to read your slides, unless, of course, there's something that you're trying to really highlight. But for the most part, no, the slides are working with you, and it's you that's presenting. And you want us to take us on this trip. You want to transition us through. You want your voice to play with it. And you want people to be interested in, and remind us what's going on. Remind us if you need to go back and say, so what, what, have I, what have I been talking about? I've been talking about how I've succeeded in this. Where did it lead to? And then you go on to your next point. You know, I've, you, ladies, this is, this is classic. You can do this. And I'm really excited about where this is going to take you as you're per- working on your next bit. The Thomas, did, did everyone give, get a chance to watch Thomas Thwaites? And this guy, again, he's, he's pretty cool. Let's see if it'll start. So, uh, this is the guy I was telling you that I can't stand the way he talks. Kills me. If we look around us, um, you know, much of what surrounds us kind of started life as... So first of all, he's all over the place. He's like moving all over. It's like, dude, stay in one place and and just slow down a little bit. Me, I like the variety and stuff, but slow down a little bit and don't do the ums. Um, anyway, but but the content of his talk is brilliant and easily something to aspire to. Various rocks and sludge buried in the ground in various places in the world. Um, but of course, they look. Um, do not do it. Don't do it. Like rocks and sludge now, they look like, you know, TV cameras, monitors, you know, annoying radio mics. And so this kind of magical transformation is what I was trying to get at with my uh, project, which became known as the Toaster Project. And it was also inspired by this quote from um, Douglas Adams. And the situation is from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And the situation it describes is the hero of the book, he's a 20th century man, finds himself alone on a strange planet populated only by a technologically primitive people and he kind of assumes that yes he'll become the kind of the, these villagers he'll become their emperor with his you know and transform their society with his wonderful command of technology and science and the elements but of course realizes that without the rest of human society uh, he can <clears throat> barely make a sandwich Let so an- another great example here he's got that big quote he's talking all around it But he doesn't actually say the quote. Alone a toaster. Uh, But he didn't have Wikipedia. So I thought, okay, I'll try and make an electric toaster from scratch. And working on the the idea that the cheapest... Complete informative talk. Do we care? Do you care about making a toaster from scratch? No, but this is really interesting. And it's a very informative talk. Electric toaster would also be the simplest reverse engineer. I went and bought the cheapest toaster I could find. Took it home and was kind of dismayed to discover that inside this object, which I'd bought for just £3.94, there were 400 different bits made out of, you know, 100 plus. So he's, he's talking about what's going on. He's just showing one picture with all the pieces. Brilliant use of a slide different materials i didn't have the rest of my life to uh, to do this project i had you know maybe nine months so i thought okay i'll start with five and these were steel mica plastic copper and nickel so at this point we now know in the toaster which parts of the toaster are made out of those five materials brilliant again he's showing us nice So, starting with steel, how do you make steel? So, I went and uh, knocked on the door of the Rio Tinto Chair of Advanced Mineral Extraction at the Royal School of Mines. What is this? He's giving himself credibility. This is the source for how do you make steel. So, he's talking about that he went and spoke to an expert. Credibility to you. And said, how do you make steel? And <laughs> Professor Silius was very kind. And So Professor Silius, who's the Rio Tinto chair. Rio Tinto is a company that makes aluminum worldwide. He's now the ex... He, he, this is what he does. He's a... He, you know, this is his field. So now I have credibility because I have consulted that person or whether it be consulting them in, in print and now talking about it. I'm adding credibility. Very important to your talk. Talk me through it and, and my vague rememberings from GCSE science. Well, steel comes from iron. So I found up an iron mine and... Oh, so now we go. We've got yet another, another piece of credibility because he's now gone to, he's called up an iron mine. 
said, oh, uh, hi, I'm trying to make a toaster. Can I come up and get some <laughs> iron? Uh, unfortunately, when I got there, it emerges Ray. Um, he had misheard me and thought I was coming up because I was trying to make a poster and so wasn't kind of prepared to take me into the mines. But uh, after some nagging, I got him to do that. Through his crease lights, though. And um, that was produced by uh, sea creatures... Uh, 350 million years ago, um, in a nice, warm, sunny yeah. atmosphere. Yeah. You can, when you study geology, you can see what's happened in the past in the world. Terrific changes in the earth. As you can see, they had the Christmas decorations up. Uh, and, of course, it wasn't actually a working mine anymore, uh, because... Though Ray was a miner there, the mine had closed. And uh... So the, the thing is, he's showing some video, maybe a little bit long. Do we really need it? He's showing what a mine's like, and he's talking about some of the challenges he had getting the materials to actually make the toaster, because that's where he's leading to, right? So that kind of works as well. He's got a little video, and what's he doing? He's, he's, he's talking about what the video gave him, what the video tells him what the video instructed him about and how the video connects to, to our understanding. Uh, you know, been reopened as a kind of a tourist attraction because, of course, it can't compete on the scale of operations which are happening in, you know, South America, Australia, wherever. Um, but anyway, I got my, uh, my suitcase of iron ore and dragged it back to uh, London on the train and then was faced with the problem, OK, how do you make this rock into components for a toaster? So I went back to Professor Celia's and he said, uh, go to the library. So I did... Um, and was looking through the undergraduate textbooks on metallurgy, uh, completely useless for what I was trying to do, because, of course, they don't actually tell you how to do it if you want to do it yourself, and you don't have, like, a, a smelting plant. So I ended up going to the History of Science Library and looking at this book. This is There we go. Another source. Yet again, he's got more sources, and he's walking through how that all brings them together. The point of this all being... Things you're looking at this and you're remembering what are we doing? So do do we care about making the toaster? Not necessarily, but the show that he's putting on, how he's giving us this information, is rather interesting. It's like what what's going on in his mind? That becomes the interesting side of it. And in the process of getting this interesting presentation, remember that show that I talk about, 90% show, the 10% content is also very much there and becomes very important. And so that, again, becomes that important side of what we're looking at and, and, and why the Thwaites video becomes interesting because it's purely informational. He's talking about where he goes and he keeps coming back to how am I supporting my claims? What is informing what I'm saying about metallurgy, etc.? Who am I talking to? Who's got authority? Where am I going to in the library to get that information? And he's telling us, he's showing us, it's giving him credibility. You need credibility with what you're talking about and you need to figure out how to do that that what am i gonna where where what brings that credibility to what i'm doing there's always something and it's really important that we do that truly truly important do we have any questions at this point by the way do i have a question questions do i have questions anyone's got a question please fire away you must have a question at this point please questions questions i know some of you're getting tired already we need to we need to take a quick break anyone have a question question Nothing? Zero questions? Okay. So what do we know so far? One, you're going to be doing an informative speech. You're already working on it. Excellent. What matters with an informative speech, like all speeches, the audience. What are you trying to do with your informative speech? You're trying to inform us, give us information, give us knowledge, expand our understanding. That's it. You need to be doing that as we've been talking about with vocal variety, giving us that show, putting the information together in a nice organized fashion that transitions from idea to idea to idea. And you need credibility. So you need to make sure that in the process of all of that happening, 
for that credibility to exist that you have some kind of backup source that's saying, hey, yeah, you know what? James is right. And this is why he's right. So you want to make sure that's all part and parcel of what you're doing. So that's really, really, really important as well. Then, not in this talk, but we, we spoke about this. We spoke about very quickly about what we, when we start thinking about images. And we, we, so we had Gar Reynolds talking about audience, whether it's with content or whether it's with the visuals. Think of your audience. Two, we had Matt Coots showing us really how to use your visuals very well. And he even puts up slides. He doesn't talk about them. He puts them up and he talks on another, another element of it so that you're filling in the gaps. You're getting double the information. Brilliant. That's that to see when I'm looking at that. And when, so, you know, take Thwaites and we're talking about professionalism. He's building a toaster folks. He's building a toaster. That is an engineering feat. He's talking metallurgy. He's talking geog- geology. And he's doing it in a way that's informative, entertaining, and educational. That is all you strive for in anything that you present. And if it's anything less than that, what's going on is what you got to be saying. Why am I not getting that kind of a presentation so that you can then go and read the textbook, you can go and read the work. And that's all you want to be doing with your own presentations is communicating in a way that is going to engage your audience so that they don't just say, oh no, I got to listen to this again because we know that happens. So don't do it. And that's when I say, I don't want my, we don't want our standard ZU presentations where people just say, today my friends and I are going to be talking to you about the interesting and peculiar endeavors of the sea lion. Sea lions are a very popular animal in the Southern Hemisphere. It's like, no one wants that. That's not so. So we want to be working on all of these pieces that come together and how we put it together. And that's what we're talking about. I want to be opening. So so let's move forward to where we're going. So you've got some information on transitions. Please do take a look at it. We've got this nice little file for, for day seven and eight. It references back to the informative speaking reading, which is this one right here, which I, you know, download it. And I encourage you to download them. I think they're very, they're very important and they're very useful. Now, here's, here's the thing that we want to be thinking about as you're thinking about your speeches. So we want to, we want to jump through this really quickly is that remember when you're doing your speech, and this is the easy side, right? Remember as you're doing your speech, what what stays the same? What what are the constants in our speeches, ladies? What are the constants in our speeches? What stays the same? Anyone? One? Introduction. Yeah. Yeah. So, So exactly. So we've got five parts. So that, that, stays the same and in those five parts your introduction and conclusion are essentially a memorized thing and I know I say you want to know your speech it's really important that you do know it because that's the only way that you really are able to present it and sound like you get it and you know it but that introduction and conclusion are your safe places. They're, they're your comfort places. They're that thing that you like to have, that teddy bear, that blanket, that piece of clothing that you always take with you and you feel comfortable with so that you can jump into it. Also, we know that there are five parts, introduction, conclusion, and then the middle part. We also know that your speech is going to be four minutes. We know this. Like that, that stuff all stays the same, right? And that becomes really really important in this case we know you also know that you've got that that sheet so vocal variety becomes really important the content becomes important the conclusion becomes important how you're sounding becomes important and again how do you do that you practice it practice it practice it practice it now when you get to the point that you say sir now i've practiced it so much i now sound i'm starting to sound robotic that means you need to practice it more and and a few more times and think about it in terms of okay my audience It's going to be their first time. I want to be so comfortable with it that it's just awesome. I know what I'm saying and I, I can, I I can work through the the, the parts. 
they're going to hear it for the first time. So you want to make sure that that, that becomes really important for, for them and for you. And remember as you're doing those things that the parts that stay the same are the structure and the time and you know all of these other little bits. It's the pieces in the middle and the type of speech that, that changes. So you've done an, an introductory speech. You're now doing an informative speech. You're going to go on to a persuasive speech and then you're going to do a motivational speech. Each type of speech you do has some different things in them. So some things stay the same. Outline, know that you've got an introduction and a conclusion and three points in the middle. That always stays the same for every speech. But in the case of an informative speech, you have different types of informative speeches. And those different types of informative speeches offer you a different way of doing them and offer you different types of content. So you might be, for instance, if, if you're doing a, depending on, on what we're talking about, you might be doing something on a theorist. You could be talking, if, if you're a psych student, you might be doing some presentations on psychology theories. You might be doing presentations on ways to do experiments. If you're an MPS student, you might be talking about how different ways of, of setting up a shot, et cetera, different ways of putting together content. So you, you could find yourself in, in a situation where you're doing talking about defining ideas that as, as it says here, and this is directly out of the text, so go and read the text as well, but might say, look, I'm defining ideas and I'm putting forward different meanings and different concepts to my audience. And so I want to, I want to build that out. So I might be doing a speech that's really based around defining things. So this, what I've done is I've simply put down an outline and I've, again, I've just pulled these right out of the text saying, okay, well, what is a sample outline? And in this case, it's talking about the title, Life is Suffering and Other Buddhist Teachings. And the, these kind of outlines, I think, are really important in general as you're thinking about what you want to do. Think about, am I giving my speech a title? What is the purpose of the speech? What is the main idea of the speech? And in this case, you know, they start off with Four Noble Truths, then the, the goes on and, and there's more to it, but it breaks it down and it, and it says, okay, well, these are the different things I'm going to talk about. And it outlines it. And then from the outline, you can go and fill it in and fill in the details as you write your speech. So the point being, the first, one of the first types of speeches you might find yourself doing is this definitional speech where you're setting out the meanings of different concepts. Again, you organize it introduction, conclusion, and then you've got your bits in the middle where you try and pull it together. And so all of this is in the reading for this week. And you know where that is. The link to that is right up here at the start. And if you go through it, you're going to see a section that has all these in it. And it, you know, it's this again, not hard, but you want to make sure in your own mind that you're thinking about what is it I'm trying to do. And then that'll help you to organize what you're trying to do. So you might be doing a descriptive speech, talking about what it's like in, at school, what it's like in a, a certain place. You might be doing a descriptive speech about what it's like to travel during COVID, what, it, what it's like to have a honeymoon during COVID, what school's like during COVID. So that, that's so you've got definitional speeches, and then you might have a very descriptive speech. A descriptive speech is different than a definitional speech in the way it put it's, it's being put together. So what are we trying to look at? In this case, they're doing a descriptive speech of Easter Island. So what have we got? Section one, stone giants. Section two, looking at the coastal activities section three looking at this natu national park that is ex exists now and within those three sections so that you've already the intro and the conclusion are outside of those three sections but within the three sections they've got multiple examples that they want to go to possibly they're going to get to everything possibly not and so again that's why you want to practice things in your case remember you only have four minutes so you got to be thinking how am i going to fit stuff in so it's useful to put the outline together I, I even do it when, when I take this piece of paper. Uh, do I have any outlines on my walls? No, I don't have one now. But if I was to show you this side of this, it's not going to go. It's all stitched together. But I've got a, a big wall over there. 
And I just stick my post-it notes, my introduction, and then I'll have my points. And I just have all these post-it notes, usually different colors, that line up with what I want to say. If I was doing it in my office at the university, I just do it on the big whiteboard in my office and line all the stuff up. If I'm doing it at school, I just find whiteboards and then I take pictures of them. And I find it really useful to do it with a whiteboard as I'm doing that. But again, thinking about, okay, am I doing a definitional speech? Am I doing a descriptive one? How is that all coming together? Am I trying to explain something? Again, explain how you cook something, explain how you teach something, explain how you do a speech. So you're, if if you're doing an explanatory speech, you know, this is, this could be kind of cool. So you're, again, what do you do? What do you give yourself a working title? What's the purpose of it? What's my central idea? And that helps you to really focus it in and then figure out, okay, what's my first point? What's my second point? What's my third point? And what are the things that I'm going to use inside as the examples, the stories, et cetera. You want to just write them down very briefly. So again, you know where you're going as you're putting together your script, as you're putting together your ideas. The final thing that you might want to do. So remember, you've got, you've got this nice explanatory speech. You might want to do a demonstration speech. And this is very practical. It's, it's really demonstrating how you do something. What was a demonstration speech that we just saw? Who had the demonstration speech? The Thwaite guy, the toaster. Demonstration speech, how to make a toaster. Same kind of thing again. Get in your head, and I, I think it just works. Again, so that you know where you're going. Get that title. What's the purpose? What's the central idea? And then one, two, three core points that you're, you're developing things. As we're putting this all together, what we want to be thinking about is ultimately how, what kind of language are you using once you've decided what you want to do? What kind of language am I using in my speech? How am I putting this all together? How is this going to work? And the big challenge that we face, and this is, again, it's, it's just time in and it's just telling yourself, you've just got, you've just got to say, this is going to feel awkward like that new pair of shoes that I've got. And they don't feel like my old pair of shoes because my old pair of shoes are worked in. My new pair of shoes are stiff and I've got to, they've got, my feet have got to get comfortable in them. Getting used to a different way of how I'm presenting stuff. So you're, you're highly organized introduction, conclusion, three points in the middle. You're going to develop them. You know that it's well organized. You know that that's the way you're doing it. You know that you got four minutes, you know that you need vocal variety. You know that you need to, to sound like you actually care. Again, this is a caring speech and you know that the way you talk is different than the way you write the way you talk and the way you write are different. You're still want to, you still want to write out your speech, but you need to write it the way you talk, not the way you write. So you need to think of those words that we write. And those often become the low impact words. So simplify your language is what I'm, I'm talking about. Again, I just pulled this right out of the text, but this is clearly where we spend a lot of time is we use, when we write, we use, a set of words and we say things that are complicated. We write in a very complicated way, but we talk in a very direct and, and, and accessible way. Think about the way you talk to friends. Think about the way you write things. So think about how you're going to use those words. And again, think about how you're putting them together. So again, what I've put together here and I've just pulled it out of the chapter is clearly Think about the wording that you're using and how that wording can be made simpler and easier for people to understand what you're saying, as opposed to trying to sound like we're, we're super, super intelligent or because we already know we're intelligent. The intelligent comes from making your ideas accessible and, and using the jargon and the words that you need to when you need to. And again, this is the other thing, girls. This is really important. So let's pause. Hit the pause button. I'm speaking about working on your speeches in very general terms. And I'm going across all things. The number one thing that, that Gar Reynolds said is you need to think about your audience. Correct? Yes. 
You need to think about your audience in more ways than one, not just in the content, not just in the visuals, but you need to think about your audience in terms of how are you going to use words and ideas because some audiences require you to do it in one way and other audiences require you to do it in another way. What do I mean? If you're presenting to a group of ZU students, you're going to talk in one way. If you're presenting to the president of the university, you're going to talk in another way. You need to know your audience and the way you're going. So the, the content might stay the same, but the way you're actually going to go about presenting it might change slightly depending on the audience. There is not necessarily one size fits all. Different audiences are going to require different things because ultimately, what are you trying to do? Remember, it goes right back to the start. Sender, receiver, you're the sender. The person you're listening to is the receiver. You're encoding, packaging the ideas, not only in the words, but in the images, in the way you talk. That's all the encoding. You want the person who's decoding it to unpack it the way you're putting it together. For what? What's the goal from the encoding to the decoding? You want to have an effect. The effect becomes very important. So different audiences will require you to present in different ways to get the, in, the necessary effect. That's, you know those ones, right? Here's a perfect example. I love these shirts, right? This is my, my school uniform. When I go and visit internship sites, usually if it's the first time I go there, I don't wear these shirts. I wear a single color shirt. Only after. They get to know me. Do I then come in these shirts? I always will wear a jacket, but then I'll change. So, so here's an example. I've been going to CID in Dubai police for, I don't know, 15, 16 years. And the first few times I went, I wore my, my regular shirt. And of course the students went and then they talked about it. Oh yeah, I've got professor James and yeah, he's, and then one time I came and I wasn't wearing the white shirt. I don't know why. Maybe I had to come right from class or something. And ever since then, if I don't wear these shirts to my Dubai police friends who are all wearing their white Kandoras and things, you know, they, they see me wearing this shirt. They all want to have pictures because that's the shirt they would love to wear, right? And so they think it's great. So, but when I would, went the first time, I'm dressed, how does a professor dress? Does a professor dress like this? No, a professor has a shirt on, nice shirt, nice jacket. You've got to look the part. So You've got to present the part. And so that becomes what I'm saying about how we do these presentations and how we work things. So it's very important, again, as we're putting things together, to, to think about, okay, well, what kind of speech am I doing? Am I doing kind of a demonstration speech, how we put things together? I know someone was talking about baking. Cool, it's kind of a demonstration speech. Am I doing a definitional speech or am I explaining things? Think about how you're putting that speech together and then think about, okay, well, what are the parts in the middle that I'm going to need to talk about? Pro tip, make sure that you keep it pretty confined and not talking way out here because you only have four minutes. And if you're talking about a lot of things, you're never going to get into any detail and you, and you want there to be some detail so people feel like they're getting some, something from what you're talking about. Trust yourself. That's the key. Trust yourself. Remember, it's, it's a whole bunch of it is the content, but a whole bunch more of it is how you're doing it. And that be, the, the two of them work together to make this exceptional, exceptional uh, opportunity. So what do we want to do at this point? So we got a lot of things here. You got a lot of things to, to think about and you've got lots of words and ideas that we've been looking at. The, the real key thing is, Remember, as you're putting this together, you're talking with us. You're talking with your audience. Audiences love to be talk, t spoken with, not at. They don't like to be lectured. So that's a really important piece. But remember, as much as I'm saying you're talking with the audience and you're not lecturing them, you are not talking with the audience. In reality, you are 100% talking at them. But you want them to have the illusion that you're talking with them. But you're, you are talking at them. The illusion. Second pro tip, and it's easier to do this in this context, harder in a class. When you're doing a presentation, yes, you want to engage the class, but you do not want to ask them questions that they have to answer in your speech because you are lecturing them 
although you want them to have the illusion you're talking with them. So if you're going to ask questions, always answer the questions before they can answer them, but you want them to feel like they're, you know, how many people drive their car into school in the morning? Can I see a show of hands? And then before you go in, you know, exactly. And so you, and even if, you know, you only get a couple, so there's a few of you, and then that lets you go through. How many of you have had a bad experience with parking in the school parking lot? Let me say exactly. And then, and then you move forward. So you give people enough time to get their hands up or only a few people up. And, and then you keep moving forward because you already have a prepared answer. Your, your goal is always to be answering the, the questions that people have coming up in their minds so that they feel like you're engaging them even though you're not. That becomes really important in what you're doing. I've done, I've done a lot of talking today. I've, I've fired a lot of information at you ladies, which is a lot of things to think about and a lot of stuff that you already know and that you're already doing, but now you're thinking more about it and saying, ah, yes, ah, yes. So what, what we want to do is, and I'll give you a, a good five minutes to prepare for this, is we want to do a, a nice, comfortable 30 to 60 second speech. So minimum of 30 seconds, maximum 60 seconds. So you've got, you've got 30 to 60 second speech to do right now off the cuff. So you got a couple seconds to plan it on advice to a friend on how to do a good presentation for their class based on what you know so far. So you're going to do a 30 to 60 second presentation, 30 to 60 seconds on advice to a friend, advice to some students on how to do a good presentation in a class. Could be to a group of high school students, could be to some ZU students, but a 30 to 60 second presentation. So minimum 30 seconds, maximum 60. Minimum 30, maximum 60. You can't go below 30 seconds. Conclusion, so think things you want to be thinking about. Okay, so you know this, right? Practice, organization, exam, all the stuff that we are, we're talking about now. Know what type of speech you're doing. Is it informative speech? Is it persuasive speech? Is it introductory speech? Know your stuff. Talk, talk with, not at, right? All the stuff that I've just been saying, so you know it all. Now you want to think, okay, how am I going to organize this? How am I going to make this sound engaging? And ultimately, as you're doing that, remember, you need a clear conclusion, you need a conclusion. So think about how the conclusion is going to come to you. Think about the two or three points that you want to put together. 30 to 60 seconds is what you get. You got five minutes to start planning that, which means we will start at, uh, it's 1051. So let's say that we're going to go at 151. So let's say we're going to go at 11 o'clock. We're going to start our speeches. I'll give you a little bit more time to put it together. So we're going to start at 11 o'clock, our 30 to 60 second speech in class on how the advice you would give to other students on how to do a good presentation. Essentially based on what we've been doing so far in class. Maybe you're going to talk Gar, Gar Reynolds. Maybe you're going to talk a little bit Matt Coots. I know there's one student in this class who I, I suggested another great talk to look at. So there's other ones too. So any questions? 30, you have minimum 30 seconds, maximum 60 seconds. What am I interested in? Do you have a great conclusion? I'm interested in your sound. No ums and ahs. Do not do them. If, you, if anyone does the um and ah thing, you start again. So we'll, you'll, you'll just start again. Speak with a little bit of a smile on your face because it makes your voice sound better vocal variety, all the stuff we've been doing. Let's get a little practice right here. We're going to kick off at 11 o'clock. Any questions? Any questions? You have been listening to Public Speaking in the Summer with me, James Pikeway. Want to find out more about what's going on? www.jamesed.com or follow me across the socials at the James Cast. Thank you very much for tuning in. More to come. This has been Public Speaking in the Summer.